Rini Bayan and I, you'll, you'll, most of you will know, is um, uh, a very, very distinguished uh, Indian poet. She's usually tagged, and I think this is the, the most extraordinary burden, but it is kind of the first significant postmodern poet in Indian English. Not a compliment. <laughs> <as well. laughs> it sounds like a lot to live up to. Um, in addition to, to being a poet, she's also, of course, uh, an academic. She's currently professor of English and Linguistics at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. And she publishes widely in linguistics, cognition, and narrative. And this week, she has out uh, Poetry in a Time of Terror, which Oxford has produced. Um, the subtitle, Essays in the Postcolonial Preternatural. I haven't read it, but I have to say it has one of the most stunning covers I've seen. I think OEP has done you proud. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, it's it's hard for me to 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 intervene in this in this debate partly because I come from a country where there are no creative writing courses so in some ways we are speculating about one and I am not sure that I'll be able to directly address the many of the questions that the chair has just raised, but I will um, try to locate myself and shift the geographical ground from the, you know, uh, in India, we, because English is the uh, medium of instruction, we have very often been voyeurs listening in to a very active conversation between America and, um, and, uh, uh, England, and of course, but sometimes lawyers have to, in Chris's immortal words, expose themselves. <laughs> and that is what I'm going to try and do by locating myself in a completely different terrain in the next five minutes and raising the sorts of questions which occur to us in India, some of them. And I'd like to begin with the, 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 this little booklet and two illustrations. And um, the first one is, located, is me, um, essentially, although this cartoon is from the New Yorker somewhere, uh, which says, uh, you know, where mother says to her son, no, you weren't downloaded, you were born. <laughs> and I find myself often making this point to my students because they are so heavily technologically oriented and they trade in second life, uh, they play games, they have investments, they make money out of games like second life. So they're already in an irrealist mode, but it's a very different mode from the writerly mode. So that's one of my locations because, uh, as Catherine mentioned, I'm a deity. The other one is Calcutta, where I was educated. And you will see a very famous writer mentioned there. Shakespeare, sex pure, <laughs> and Sarani, which is road, and then you see Park Street, and you see the police station and the bookstore above it. And if, if I had to make this up, I couldn't have a better uh, location to talk about the kind, the, a better visual medium. Uh, this is just a photograph but to talk about the kind of dilemmas, and even if I just fall silent now, maybe we can meditate <laughs> on <laughs> Shakespeare, Sarani. So uh, I, I, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to take you away from Shakespeare, just very briefly, for my provocation one, which is to move to a very famous British scientist who visited India, and his name was Stephen Hawking. And, um, when Hawking came to India, I was listening to debates which he had, uh, 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 where he was talking about the end of physics in universities because in 20 years time the major questions in physics would have been answered and then physics would become redundant. And uh, so I put up and I asked him what about poetry and he typed it out immediately. And he said, and what he typed then you heard him say is, Poetry is already redundant. And I think in this thesis about the redundancy of poetry, the excess of poetry, 
we have lessons to ask about whether we should have creative writing courses in as perhaps redundant um, uh, additions or uh, insertions into our university structure. So, uh, uh, talking about redundancy, I have to say that I feel that in many ways my education is now redundant because I teach techies and uh, I try to introduce them to literature and to linguistics and so on. And uh, the, the people I grew up with, uh, learning, which part of the Calcutta University syllabus today, were people like Matthew Arnold, uh, Thomas Carlyle, and they're on the first page of the handout, and Cardinal Newman. And they're interesting because uh, Carlyle said, the true university of our days is a collection of books. And in saying that, he said that the rise of the printing press had produced a new kind of hero in academia, the hero as a man of letters. And so we must ask, what kind of hero? And in India, I suspect that many of the impulses of writing have actually gone into Bollywood and lyric writing. So they are industrial. There is a huge industrial support. It's just fortunate that it isn't within the university. So uh, we, have, we have to ask, what kind of hero is the man of letters today? If, we, if the man of letters or the person of letters. And uh, his selection is important because he has Rousseau um, and Johnson and Burns. And the other kind of person I read on the idea of the university was Newman, who said that the university cannot be a place for moral instruction because um, it, 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 uh, where would literature and science be then in a university? And it could not be a place for, um, uh, he said, for What's the other thing? Yeah, he said it cannot be just for the advancement of knowledge because then where would there be students in a university? So he <laughs> wanted to get an idea of a university which was all about teaching. And that is interesting to me that what was central for him and today these were the texts I came into university with. So it's strange that I have to recycle them now for our students. I wanted to talk briefly about not only the kind of teaching you might have in universities for creative writing, but also the types of models of universities which we have. One, the first model is the standard universe, standard issue, modern university, which is universal, co but by the same token, coercive. Um, and it grants degrees, it is an impetus imprimatur granting body, but by, it's also inhuman because it's a machine. And then you have a quote from Lyotard there. So one kind of question is, is uh, of which we've already discussed, are writers really misfits within the university system because they dissolve the subject-object distinction. The writer is always somebody who studied and read and this is why the deadness of the writer is so important. But in, in some ways, uh, you know, uh, the writer, when he gets up and speaks, becomes the, st the studier, you know, the, the person who's experiencing it. This is why there is this uneasy fit and sharp division in modern universities between, I mean, one of the reasons uh, between the writer and um, the academic. I have a mock course which I will not read out, which I couldn't <laughs> resist making, on what, how the writer would, uh, how these questions, such as ones Chris put on our hand, might be asked. There are two quotes there, and one of the quotes is from um, Socrates, but the other one is from Salman Rushdie, who says the writer's job is to provoke. 